just what do you think about sort of having the state bring in large industries large, by way of uh, you know tax breaks and things like that, like sports stadiums, cracker plants, um, yep. Amazon, and uh, you know similar things. Just just feel free to go for it. The work working conditions inside those uh, inside those fact what my, I don't know what they're called factories I guess where it's really human factories of people uh, fulfilling orders um, they, sh they they border on illegal they 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 make sure that they're just within the law uh, but those are terrible circumstances to work under and more than that those kinds of industries undermine our local economy to a great extent. And I think we need to be very thoughtful and careful about giving tax breaks to these kinds of entities and to do a cost benefit analysis before you do anything like that. And also uh, to not have it for eternity. You need to have phase out, you need to have clawbacks if they didn't actually perform, if we did give them some uh, breaks, how were they performing? What do we, what clawbacks do we have in place to make sure that we can recoup things and recoup our resources if they were to leave or do something untoward than what was laid out in those um, tax break uh, uh, agreements? But and then talking about and I spoke to the cracker barrel cracker barrel cracker plant issues um, around the whole issue of moving to clean energy and how we do that thoughtfully without leaving anybody behind and how we um, actually create resources to make sure we support workers as, as they're transitioning. And, you know, uh, there was a conversation in the congressional um, part of this, uh, uh, of this conversation about how do you bring people along? You know, it's everyday folks who have, have some job that's related to that. Uh, as a scientist, I deeply believe that we are uh, really, global warming is destroying our globe. But how do we transition thoughtfully and carefully? And I spoke about the hydrogen cell plant fuel. Uh, can, 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 can I, I'd like to hear from other people. I, that, I, I really appreciate that, but I want to give everybody a chance. Sure, yeah. yeah. So I, I'll go. Um, I think you may have seen the um, uh, story in the in the uh, city paper uh, a month or two ago about subsidies in these industries um you know i i i believe that um that the, that there shouldn't be massive public subsidies to industries that are thriving and so massive subsidies going to petrochemical industry uh should be stopped in pennsylvania and uh and i believe that um the, but it also goes beyond that i mean i think some of you may have read some of the stuff that i've written about amazon and the, and, the, and the current facility that's being built out in our western suburbs. Um, you know, they were given tax incentives to come here, and then they're hiring a bunch of people from out of state. Part of that tax incentive was to, to hire local, and they're not doing that. So we've got to hold them accountable. Fortunately, you know, our unions, myself, and others in the, um, in the, uh, the tax fraud task force have really come to bear on that, and they are finally now beginning to hire some local contractors uh, to, to do some of the work out there. But we have missed an opportunity there and the, and the state should uh, should really take an accounting of that to see uh, how those programs, how they work, because we know in this case, it didn't work as well as it should have and wouldn't work at all if we wouldn't have jumped out there and spoken out against it. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess, Scott, Rose? Um, Tracy? Yeah. Yeah, Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I agree with um with uh, Mike and Nina. But what I would like to add is that I think that um we need to do a better job of explaining, especially to our underserved communities, why jobs with these type of companies um aren't a good idea because it's hard if if people don't understand when they're unemployed or underemployed what type of situation they would be getting into by going to work for companies like that. And I think that that's, that's a way that the Auditor General's office could serve as a community outreach by discussing, you know, at, at the community level, you know, with, with residents and, and taxpayers. 
Um, this is Christina. I'll just jump in for a minute. I would also add that, you know, um, I think we'd look at this from both a micro and a macro perspective. So what are each of us doing um, and are we living by the values that we profess? So, for example, do we have an Amazon Prime account? Are we making sure that we're limiting our carbon footprint ourselves? Um, and I have to say I fall into the category of a person who's trying to make sure I'm doing those things every day. Um, and then taking that to the macro level in this leadership role, um, looking at where those tax incentives have been provided in the past and auditing those pieces if they haven't been done already. And in terms of environmental protections, um, you know, our current Auditor General has uh, recently released a climate change report and the amount of money that the state, um, you know, is, it's costing the state because we're not addressing climate change specifically. Um, if I'm not mistaken, it was something like $280 million it was a lot of money. Um, and so, you know, as Auditor General, I want to make sure that we continue to do that report um, on a yearly or, you know, by a yearly basis, whatever is reasonable, um, to make sure that we're reflecting um, those losses um, and or as, 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 um, as we're able to in the performance audits reflect um, what cost benefit um, we're getting from these tax incentives or what we're not um, and what it might be costing us in other ways. Hi, this is Rose Davis. I want to jump in for a minute. I just want to reiterate that um, it is extremely important that the Auditor General um, look at those deals from a compliance perspective because at the end of the day, if there are incentives given to bring these industries over to uh, various uh, counties here in Pennsylvania, that they're held accountable to, um, to doing what uh, was agreed upon. And I can say that um, in my county, we, we just received quite a few of those um, um, companies. Um, and I think we're probably within the last uh, year or so, uh, we've gotten um, quite a few um, um, distribution type companies that have come in and um, to provide jobs to, um, you know, the locals in up around the Mount Pocono area, up in Tobihana. They came in and, and uh, they brought a lot of jobs with them. And uh, they did hire the local folks because that was what they were supposed to do and they uh, abided by um, their agreement that they would. So at the end of the day, just like what Michael Lamb mentioned, if, if you're gonna bring these folks in here, you gotta hold them accountable so that um, they follow um, the agreement. And if not, then there should be some kind of mechanism to issue some, some type of sanctions. And that's something that, um, that those types of recommendations or information is what's given to the legislators so they can build that into the legislation. Because as an auditor general, we can't create legis legislation. But we can provide advice to help craft legislation that's going to be effective. That's it. You have time for one more? You have time for one more? Sure. Yeah. The, um, it's funny because the same question was asked me, was asked out at the Progressive Summit out in Philadelphia. The main reason why I am running for Auditor General for 21 years of public service, I've seen no, very little oversight to many of the dollars that we give out from the public. It doesn't matter whether we're talking to tax credits from the state for hiring to make sure people stay inside. The Delaware loophole, which only less than 20% of the corporations in Pennsylvania pay taxes because we don't go after combined reporting. When we look at the money that, that we give for the tax-free zones, we, we have many of the companies that go in there are not holding their end of the bargain. When you look at the fact that we give money to the chambers, we give land to them, and then we give them for rehabilitation. I can show you instances where the chamber themselves sold the money at pennies on the dollar. To, the, to members within without, without going out to bid. When you talk about Amazons and when you talk about these type of companies, it's just the tip of the iceberg. As an Auditor General, we have to be willing to go after these folks because again, you hear me say it a lot, we're not above the law. And if we're gonna be sincere about this job, we can't be worried about a campaign donation, about upsetting a donor. We have to be able to go out and do what's right and make sure that everybody is held accountable, not just the Amazons in the world, but everybody who works in Pennsylvania and gets Pennsylvania money, or should, should I say as a business in Pennsylvania. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, this... Looks like Liz might have uh, something to say. Okay. Liz?
Well, I don't seem to be able to unmute her. Um, All right, am I unmuted? Uh, yep, you are. Okay, I wanted to remind everyone that um, the club endorses a candidate who gets 40% of the votes with the auditor general's race having six candidates it's really important that you do preferential voting, which means you say, who would be your first choice, your second choice, your third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Um, because with so many candidates, it may be hard to wind up with an endorsed candidate. It's possible we'll have no endorsement. But if you do that rank ordering or preferential voting, um, it may help clarify that. So I just wanted to ask everybody as you vote to make sure in that race that you do preferential voting. Thank you. Yes, you should vote for everyone you think is capable of doing a good job, period. Everyone you think that we could reasonably endorse. Wow. You sure that? Well, and when you look at the ballot, um, anyone who's received it and clicked through to it will, will notice this, that you can uh, add people in order. Um, and up to, you know, up to all of the candidates. Uh, only the first choices will be counted on the uh, first round. And if nobody reaches 40% on the first round, then we'll go to the second round where whoever has the least votes is uh, drops out and their second choices are added to whoever continues like that until somebody gets to 40%, unless nobody gets to 40%. There is also, and this is required by our bylaws, an option for no endorsement. So if you just think we shouldn't endorse in the race, you can choose that. Uh, Ron says, uh, who among many other things for the club, uh, runs the website, says we'll, we'll put up all the candidates' uh, websites there. So uh, if anybody, um, if anybody would like to, uh, if anybody would like to um, send those along as a candidate, we'll make sure those get up there. And a number of you already have in the in the chat. There's a question here that was just added that says, "Is there time for us as individuals to check the accuracy of claims made by one candidate about another?" Um, so maybe Marianne can come on and explain a little more about what she. Uh, what she means by that, and maybe we can invite candidates who something has been said about them to uh, comment on whether that's true or not. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Well, I was obviously perhaps thinking about uh, claims made by um, by Jerry Dickinson about Mike Doyle, and I wondered if they're all if they're all accurate. And I need I feel I need time to find that out. Well, I'm afraid it looks like uh, both Jerry Dickinson and Mike Doyle have left. Yeah. Um, and so I, I suppose the answer is that, you know, the time you have is between now and uh, between now and June 2nd. Um, but here, in order to uh, vote on the endorsement, when is the deadline for the vote on the endorsement today? I'll keep that open for a few more hours. Let's let's say I believe that what I said in a in the meeting last week was I'd keep it open until eight. Um, so I'll do that. Uh, I, I'm afraid what I don't have is a good place to direct you to you know to fact check uh, Jerry's claims. Thank you. Now, now here's a, uh, there is a new Zoom meeting that has been made, which uh, folks could head over to and people who, who weren't able to hang around in here, uh, We'll be able to get there, and I believe we'll send that uh, 
We'll send that out to everybody. And that if, if anybody wants to go and check in, see if there is any additional, you know, if there are any additional questions, or if this has just been plenty long enough for you and you'd like to go do something else, you're welcome to do that also. Uh, but uh, given the troll problem, I'd rather not post the link for that in here because I'm not sure who's still left who's not really a member. So uh, we're going to email that out to the same email list that we sent uh, the previous link to and also to the candidates. Um, would anyone like to answer this question from Ed Wren before we go? What do you think of the influence of campaign contributions in politics and the extent of self-enrichment in our political system? Rose Davis first. <laughs> I think it's tremendous that when, when you are, when you receive monies from certain interest, it's a little difficult for you to issue an unbiased and independent and honest assessment of a program or situation that affects the industry that has contributed significantly to you. So that's one of the reasons why the Auditor General role should be held by an, indivi by an individual that is independent, lack political debt, no affiliations, no ties. And as a matter of fact, that's the only reason why the Auditor General's office is an elected office and not an appointed position by the governor, because that factor was changed back in 1850, I believe. So yeah, it has, a, it has a, an impact. So that's, that's what I have to say on that. Um, Mac, I just wanted to say that I support publicly financed elections, which we don't have. <laughs> and uh, I wish there was a real move towards that. That would take away the election uh, com complex uh, apparatus that operates for all, of, all our candidates probably face that. It's uh, really, really terrible to have to spend more time trying to fundraise and now it's impossible to fundraise in this environment to be able to get your message out. And I think uh, we could look at some good models that exist in Europe to be able to get your message out, everybody getting the same time, same resources, uh, and, um, and making it a truncated time to put your uh, message out and be talking to people. Yeah, the only other thing I wanna add is that um, the, the Auditor General's office uh, can be a very hard office to raise money for because we, that office does not set any policy. So when you add that to the fact that a lot of people are still uh, unaware as to what we actually do, it's really difficult. So um, there is a lot of self-financing that goes on, you know, especially for me in the running of this race. Um, me putting my own money in and the donations from friends and family. I'll jump on that as well. The, uh, when you, after 21 years of service, I can tell you that my colleagues are more interested in collecting campaign cash than they are in doing their job. We really have to do something about the campaign laws. If you look at my campaign accounts, you don't see any money in it because mm -hmm. I'm not gonna go around and chase every millionaire or every group there is, every national group, every local group, trying to do their bidding for them to get their check. You have to be independent. We have to come up with a better way. Pennsylvania has to come up with a better way of funding campaigns. So we don't have candidates that's owned by a certain organization or, or owned by a certain individual. And I'm, I'm with the other candidates that spoke. We have to stop it. Just to echo those thoughts, Ed, um, I think, again, this office is one that um, isn't so sexy, so raising money isn't really a thing. I mean, we raise it, but it's not like other offices. I think it's worth pointing out, though, Pennsylvania has no limits for statewide office or for state reps or state senators. Um, no limits at all, actually. So oftentimes folks are focused on Congress and the federal races when it comes to finance laws. Um, but I think it would behoove us to actually look at Pennsylvania's finance laws um, because while the ones for Congress are, you know, they are what they are, there is a limit um, and there are no limits in Pennsylvania. And I think that's really upsetting. Um, and, and again, sort of something that we should probably take a look at. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and just to follow up 
on that, I would like to say that um, when I decided to run in, um, in talking to some politicos and things of that nature, I was told early on that if I didn't have 200 to $250,000 in my campaign account um, before December, I just shouldn't run. And that was very disheartening, but I also knew that that was number one, a number I wasn't going to reach, but I still wanted to try. And so, you know, I, I really do um, believe in the idea of, um, you know, public funding for these offices, because like it's been said earlier, the Auditor General is supposed to serve as the top fiscal watchdog. We are, this is a department that stresses very strongly ethics. We have to sign ethics statements every year. Um, we have to make sure that we adhere to all departments' um, rules and responsibility, uh, rules and policies and procedures, um, independence and things of that nature. So, um, it, we you don't want an auditor general to be holding to anybody else, you know, to any any other you know PACs or you know um, organizations or things of that nature that could influence um, the way they report audit results. If I could just weigh in on this, uh, first off, let me, you know, here in Pittsburgh, as, as you know, we have passed some legislation restricting contributions to certain limits, um, pretty much in line with the federal limitations. The fact, and Christina's right, I mean, the fact that Pennsylvania has nothing, has done nothing on this uh, is, is shocking, frankly. Um, and the fact that our rules are so lenient, and, and, that, and on top of that, You've got a situation where many of our legislators are now saying that they don't need to tell you where their money gets spent. You know, so you've got you've got on the on the on the on the public side, you've got them not disclosing where their money goes. Um, and then on the political side, they have no limitations at all. I mean, this really we really need to have a higher ethical standard for public officials in our Commonwealth. Well, my job back before uh, I went to law school was political fundraising. And I remember a friend of mine who was also in that business saying, some politicians are good at raising money, but all the ones who like it are in prison. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Debbie, was Debbie. Was that, you could say something. Uh, hi, uh, this is Debbie McKinney. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm not a technology person, so this worked. Okay. So I um, have been involved in the club for um, the better part of 30 years. I was the president at one point. Um, I want to talk about Mike Doyle's history with the club. The first time that he ran in the congressional district that comprised the city of Pittsburgh was after our um, congressman, Bill Coyne, retired from office. Uh, and Mike Doyle, at, at that point, he was simultaneous with Bill Coyne, but in an adjacent district that comprised mostly suburbs. And uh, I reviewed his voting history and found it to be extremely conservative. At that meeting, I got up and presented that to the organization, and we uh, ended up giving him a no endorsement. This was probably in the late 1990s, off the top of my head. Since then, and almost immediately after that, all of, the, all of his positions would be, he's taken positions that would, in my view, align very closely with the, the positions of the typical club member. Um, and he was adamant, you know, very strongly anti-choice, and that really, you know, was one of the reasons that, you know, gave me the impetus to suggest the no endorsement. He, very shortly after that, re re um, reversed these positions, and he is very solidly um, uh, very solid, in my opinion, on all these issues, including uh, on abortion rights. And um, I think that just to say that, I, I think that my position would be that we welcome converts. And, um, and that's why at least that I, I'm supporting him, um, because everybody has uh, the right to change their position. So that's, that's his history with the club, endorsed. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, well, I don't know that there's much else for us to do here. 